What's happening, Hoodlum Gang? Welcome back to my channel. It's your boy Hoodie from the Hood, aka your friend from that big old end. And today, I'm gonna do something a little different. I got two very special guests. Uh, one you may or may not remember from being on the platform, um, and another special guest. But without further ado, go ahead and introduce yourself to the people. Let them know who you are. Right, right. Um, explain to the people what Pillars of the Community is. Pillars of the Community is a nonprofit organization that advocates for people negatively impacted by law enforcement, which means that just because you grew up on Market Street or Imperial or wherever, and you're always getting harassed by the GSU, Gang Suppression Unit, that's not okay. For so many years, you know, people from our community has been taking the advocacy, you know, um, since resetting some laws, uh, legislation, unsheltered outreach. Can you leave out anything? And most importantly, we do a lot of work in police accountability, right? So, po police accountability. Right. Um, so, like Michael was saying, uh, a lot of the times when we grow up in these neighborhoods, we're harassed by police, we're racially profiled, we're discriminated against, right? And so, part of a big part of our work is what do you do when somebody has violated your rights? What do you do when you've been uh, abused by the police, right? How, how do you assert your rights in those moments? <laughs> okay, and how, how do you, what's the process of holding them accountable? Well, um, you know, there's, there's either three, three ways you can go about, okay. or two ways actually, there's three ways you can go about this, the whole police harassment. Right. You can either take it on the chin like we've been doing for the last hundred years, you can either go out in a blaze of glory, which you know we really don't recommend because you're just going to be a short conversation and a you know a wild story, or you can start you know filing complaints. You can um, start knowing your, the laws, knowing the, the police code and conduct policy book, and um, filing complaints against them. You know, if anybody that's been to prison knows that 602s work if they're wrote properly, right. and what a complaint is is pretty much a 602. You file a complaint on the police and you know getting getting marks on their record. So that's it. We, um, we file complaints, we, um, which are which in most cases can lead to lawsuits. Um, the first step in filing a lawsuit is filing a complaint. So, and, and plus, we want to document all these racist cops that's in our community. I want we want to document all these racist cops that's in our community. You know, because just say two years from now somebody goes to trial and the cop that arrested him has eight blemishes, eight complaints on it, for all for the same thing that the guy's in jail for. It, it gives them action at, you know, beating the case. Right, because it's, they see a pattern. Yeah. Um. And, and when they don't see, I mean, everybody in Southeast, every, every ghetto in America knows all the harassment and terrorization that goes on, but if no one's filed a complaint, it never happened. In the laws, of the, it, it never happened, you know what I'm saying? So. Like in San Diego, I think the police uh, force said they're, they're the safest city and the most, like, what they say, unbiased, like, have no complaints. They're like the most pleasant police department in the, the country. Can and, I talk about that a little bit? And people let's know it's not Yeah, true. please do. Right, let's expand on that a little bit. So let's think about when you are rolling down your hood, right, and you drive your car down the street and there's a police officer behind you. What are some feelings that you feel? Fear. Fear. What I'm not going to lie. Uh, desperation, even if you don't have it, I mean, this could be your last moment, you never know. Right. Why? Why do you feel those things? Because, for one, the cops have been known to kill black men for nothing. Right. Or take us to prison for nothing, you know, so that's always a fear. As a black man, I don't know how, you know, as a woman, but as a black man, uh, death in prison. Well, one of the things that we hear when police are talking, right, is that they are about what? Safe. Safety. Right? But if you ask anybody, in our neighborhoods, how you feel when you're stopped by a police officer, you never hear the word that you feel safe, right? You never hear those words. People feel terrified, people feel fear, people feel anxious, people feel nervous, right? And there's so many reasons we feel that, right? We don't immediately feel safety when we see police officers, right? And that's because of what they've done to our lives. So we, we think about this a little bit. That's because of the way that they've over-policed our people. That's because of the way they have um, overly charged our communities. That is because of the way they have racially profiled our communities. 
communities. That is because of the way they have discriminated against our communities. That is because of the way they've abused our people, right? And so one of the really important things about police accountability is really helping to shape what that narrative looks like, right? What people are really experiencing on the street versus what they're telling you they're doing. Right. Space, right? And that's what we want to change. And so when we talk about police accountability, we talk about these kinds of forms of things, right? Don't worry, it'll get edited. <laughs> On the real, while we had it, huh? <laughs> All right, go ahead. So one of the first things in police accountability is knowing your rights, right? Because your rights can be violated left and right, and you won't even know it, right? And so how do you assert your rights if you don't know them, right? So one of the first things that we do is help to inform people of their rights when they're interacting with police, right? So making sure that you know that you do not have to um, stay and talk to a police officer if you're not being the team. Making sure that you know that you do not have to consent to a search if they don't have a warrant or probable cause to search your belongings, right? Uh, making sure you know that you can ask for an attorney and you don't have to speak to police officers if now they have to team, right? But what, what do we know? We know that even if you do assert your rights, what happens? Get violated anyway. They still violate your rights anyway. Oh yeah, definitely. But what are your, um, what's your recourse after they violate your rights? A lot of people don't do anything, right? One, because they don't know what their rights are. And second, they don't know what to do after their rights have been violated, right? And so one of the really important things that we talk about are filing for police reports, right? So. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the one just passed. Uh, it's a well, flight pass. Five minutes. And that one sound louder than the first one. <laughs> you know they got these like microphones that like muffle the sound. Yeah, they have these microphones you can get that muffle the sound. Like, mm. Right. It's pretty much, a, it's, it's a loose noose around your neck. Right. Just waiting for you. It just get tighter and tighter once you're on paperwork. You once they got you in the system already. Thing. The smallest thing, violation. I spent years going back, and he can attest to this, for the smallest infractions, going back, taking months, and sometimes years, depending on the situation, over the smallest thing. Because that, that's how they get you. Um. I, not to backtrack, but there's two things I wanted to say when you were talking about when you see the police and how does it make you feel when he shot me the address? I was like, fuck, I got to go over there. I shouldn't have to feel like that if they're here to protect and serve instead of discriminate and harass. That's what I always said they should have on the side of their car to harass and discriminate because that's what they do. But I'm like, damn, I don't even want to go over there um, Two, when you said that you don't have to talk to the police. I remember this was about 2007, I believe. And um, we was walking from 49th to 47th, right on Guyman. And um, it was about 10, 15 of us. You know, we young, 17, 18, 19, banged out, blew it up, whatever. The police came up, 47, turned right there on Guyman, slowed down, and they was like, hey, where y'all going? And I'm the only one speaking. I don't know why nobody else said nothing. I'm like, Shit, we going where we going? He like, can I talk to y'all? He had the door kind of open. I said, no, you can't. Tell me why they kept going and didn't turn around. Kept going up Guyman, never even busted a U-turn and not even knowing my rights, just being an asshole. Yeah. Nah, you can't talk to us. <laughs> yeah. And they never turned around. Yeah. 
Yeah, people. So. Yeah, people. Uh, they scared. They fear the police. They want to comply with the searches. Even oh, I don't got nothing in my car. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna make myself look guilty if I let if I don't let, let them search. But that's your. That's your. That's yeah, your that's your. Right. Man, I don't care if I look guilty. You can't search. You wouldn't. You wouldn't let the hardest, the hardest gang member in your neighborhood just walk up and go in your pocket. You let this cop with a buzz cut go through your pocket. You know what I'm saying? Just right. so you don't appear guilty. And that's not right. We got to change that narrative. For sure. And that's the first thing they're going to say to you, too. They're going to say, well, if you ain't got nothing in the car, why can't I search? Well, one of the first questions they ask you when they pull you over is, you know, and that's what we try to teach people. When, when they first pull you over, you want to ask them, what do you pull me over for? So you can pin them in the, in the corner. You know what I'm saying? And then the first, they're going to ask you a little, do you a bullshit? They'll, they'll tell like that. Any passengers in the car? Do you? The first question they're going to ask anyone is anyone in the car on probation or parole. The reason why they're answering that question is they're trying to see how many of your rights they can violate. Right. If anybody in the car is a fourth waiver, everybody's getting out regardless. And that's not even supposed to be the case. They're only supposed to set the, to search the the area that they're accessible to. But they get everyone out the car. They go through the hood of the trunk, the hood, the trunk, every everywhere that this person, you know. Just because, it's, and and the person didn't even have to talk to him in the first place. So that's one thing we want people to know. If, when the police come and there's cops on both sides, <clears throat> the only person that should be talking is the driver. Everybody else don't have to say anything. Now, if they ask you for your name, you know, more than likely give you a name. And that's it. You don't even have to produce an ID. A lot of people don't know that. California is a no ID state. Say you walk into the store and the police just smash on you. Give, give me your ID. You don't have to give them nothing. By law, you don't have to give them anything, you know what I mean? But you can't lie to the police about your name. If you lie about that name, then, you know, they can right. bring up some bullshit. But if you give them your real name, that's it. That's all you have to do. But if you're, if you're operating a motor vehicle, you have to have a license. All right. Now, now I'm glad that you brought up um, when they pull you over, they got to tell you what they're pulling you over for. Um, I got a video from, I want to say... April 10th, when we went to L.A., I don't know if you've seen it, and the police came, and they was harassing one of the homies out there, basically, like, I, I don't know exactly why they got on him, his car was parked, they came, he walked towards his car, they got on him, so he's sitting in his car, and it's people who know the law out there, and they telling him, hey, y'all want to run his name and all that, that's cool, all that extra stuff, searching his car, and do you're not doing that. I got the whole thing captured. And uh, I think I think they may have patted him down when he was outside of the car, then they let him sit in the car and uh, they ran his name and then they left. Didn't search his car or nothing. Yeah, so, you shouldn't get your car searched for, especially for no, no uh, minor traffic violation. You know I mean? Well, we was all parked. We was in a parking lot. Yeah. And the police came and he walked towards his car and for some reason they got on him and probably thought that he did something but he didn't. But even if you don't have a license, no insurance, your tail light is out, your blinker don't work, you had your whatever, they still that still shouldn't call for a, a, a search of your vehicle. I think this is why it's really important to know your rights, right? Because you gave a really good example of how people stepped in to say, you can't search his car, make sure that um, ensuring that he knows that he can not consent to a search, right? A lot of the time what happens is when our rights get violated, it's because we let them get violated. Right. Because we don't know any better. Right? And we give we give information to officers that we don't have to. And in fact, we give information to them that could be incriminating to us. Mm -hmm. Right. So one of the things I like to say is like when you're talking to a police officer, it's so easy to, to think like, oh, I'm just going to tell them this information. Oh, I don't want to seem guilty. Oh, right. I'm a little bit anxious. I'm a little bit nervous. I just want to give this information. I just want this to be over with. And sometimes people think that that's a police officer. They have authority over me. They have power over me, right? They have a gun on their waist, right? So people are afraid to. So they start divulging information they don't have to that there. Right. And once you open that door, they're not violating your rights if you're willing to give them, right? So one of the really important things to know is that you do not have to stop to talk to the police officer, okay? So if the police officer approaches you while you walk in, a lot of the times they'll try to act friendly, right? Like, I I just want to ask you a few questions. Right. I'm going to ask you where you're going. Where are you right? coming from, buddy? And you don't know that they're trying to get to something, right? You start answering these questions. You're just trying to be nice. You're just trying to answer these simple questions, right? 
but now you're talking to them when you don't have to. Right? So one of the first things you should do when an officer is asking you these questions is say, Am I being detained or am I free to go? Because if you're being detained, that means you're being suspected of a crime. Right. If you're not being detained, that means you're free to walk away from them. Right. So you can walk away from them, and I always suggest that people do. Right. If they do, in fact, say that you're being detained, that means you're being suspected of a crime, and then should what? Shut. Remain silent. <laughs> you should shut up. Remain silent. Right? Yes. Stop talking. Because the more that you talk, the more that you're going to incriminate yourself for right, any right. potential crime. But people think they can talk their way out of it, and you can't. But you you think, can't. They think they can outsmart the police, and it's just not going to happen. The Miranda, the Miranda says anything you say can and will be used against you. It doesn't say anything you say will be used to help you get out of this right. jam. They it's literally you know. tell you your Miranda rights are reminding you of your Fifth Amendment right, right. right to remain silent and that you have a right to an attorney. So that's exactly what your Miranda rights tell you, right? You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you when you have the right to an attorney, right? They say anything you say can and will be used against you. That's because the job of the police is literally to prove the case against you. Right. Right? They don't tell you anything you say can and will be used to free you. Right. Right? And that's intentional. That's because anything you say to a police officer is going to be used against you. Right. So there's nothing that you could say to them that's going to free you, that's going to help you, <laughs> that's going to get you out of this situation. So it's always best just to stay silent. And once you've stayed silent, right, after they've said that you are being detained, that means you're being suspected of committing a crime or about to commit a crime, you should remain silent and then ask for a lawyer. Ask for a lawyer. As soon as you say that, as you you have to do both, right? Say that you want to remain silent and speak to, that you want to speak to your attorney. Once you say that, they should immediately stop questioning. They not have a, to. Not a single question after that. We don't understand how people be in interrogation rooms for three days straight, <laughs> false confessing just to get out of there. Right. When all they had to do was ask for an attorney. You right. Know what I mean? And, and, and it didn't trick you over. into, uh, like you said, into uh, the corner that admitting you, to something yeah. that you. And then they find any little, they going to pull that strings. And not only that, you might implicate other people. Now your whole career is fucked up. You know right. What I'm saying? So the best thing to do, and I, we've actually seen a lot of people beat cases because they remain silent. Right. You know what I'm saying? They didn't say nothing. They don't care what, oh, I, I'm gonna, I didn't do it, so I'm going to, no, the police don't care. The police came from slave catchers. Their job was to, to catch a runaway slave that ran away from the play, plantation and bring him back to the plantation. The original cops, the original badge has slave catchers. Right. The cops nowadays are catching the slave. It, it, which amendment is it that, that bans slavery except if you're in a, a, a California prison? The 13th Amendment bans slavery unless you're incarcerated. So what do the police do now? They're catching these slaves, black, blacks and browns, and they're taking them to the plantation, which is the BIA, the prison industrial authority, multi-billion dollar industry. Right. Or you're in there just making 12 cents an hour for nothing, getting 55% of it too. It's the, it's the modern day slave plantation. Right. Give an example of how like a, a situation can change based on when you search your rights, right? So let's give this example. So say a police officer stops you and arrests you because they have probable cause to believe that you were selling drugs to neighborhood kids, right? So now they've arrested you. One of the first things that they have to do is read you your Miranda rights. So inform you of your Fifth Amendment rights. They have to tell you that you have the right to remain silent and that you have the right to an attorney, right? Because now you're in custody. They only have to read you your Miranda rights if they're starting to question, right? If they're interrogating you, asking you questions that could get you in trouble for, that could incriminate you for the particular crime in which they've arrested you for. Right. So let's say now you're in custody, now they're interrogating you, but they did not read you your Miranda warnings, right? They did not. They didn't, they didn't warn you of your Miranda and all of a sudden, now you start talking. You're like, um, it wasn't me that killed him, Ray Ray never killed him. It wasn't me, <laughs> right? It wasn't me, because yeah. now you're anxious, you just want to tell them the stuff, right? Now you've made a spontaneous statement, right? Now, um, let's say they're not questioning, sorry, they're not questioning you, and you start making, they haven't asked you any questions yet. Mm -hmm. You're only in custody, they haven't asked you any questions yet. Now you're making all these spontaneous statements, you're just telling them, okay, let me just tell you who the drugs belong to, because it's not mine, I was just holding it for the homie. All this stuff, right? 
Now you've made these spontaneous statements. Now everything you have said can be used against you in court, right? Because they were not required to read you your Miranda warnings if they had not asked you any questions, right? Whereas let's flip the script. Let's say you are in custody and now they're questioning you, right? Now they're questioning you. Now that means they are required to warn you of your Miranda rights, which is that you have the right to remain silent and that you have the right to an attorney, mm -hmm. right? And let's say they don't do that. And now you start talking. Now you start saying the same stuff. Like, I was just holding, I was just holding this for my homie and blah, 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 blah. Now everything you say, because they didn't warn you of your Miranda warnings, cannot be used against you. Even if you had stuff on you, mm. right? So that's the difference between like knowing your rights and not knowing your rights, right? Because if you know your rights and you know that any confession you have made can't be used against you because they were legally required to give you your Miranda rights and they did not. They didn't remind you that you had the right to remain silent and speak to an attorney. That's why it's always best because a lot of the times we're in these situations and there's a lot of gray area, right? You don't know when your rights kick in. You don't know if you're being detained. Sometimes they're not being honest about whether or not you're being detained. They're not giving you answers or things like this, right? That's why it's always just best to just stay silent so that you don't give them the opportunity to hem you up, right? You don't give them the opportunity to find incriminating things against you. Can I give you a scenario that happened to me and I want y'all to tell me where the police went wrong? Yeah. Um, this was 2017. Um, I don't, I don't know if you remember this. I didn't come on until 18. All right. 2017, uh, it was a funeral. Um, one of the homies passed away. And it was actually on April 7th, which, you know, the police know as uh, a hood day. Um, the funeral just happened to be on that day. Now, the funeral is in National City. Um, obviously, our area being in Southeast San Diego. So we go to the funeral right there on Highland. And... Um, we don't know that there's police watching the funeral so when we leave i'm going up highland going north on highland san diego police is coming down highland because there was unmarked cars and they you know caught the, the, the yeah so they're coming down i guess they see me and they see the homies in front of us they bust a u-turn they trying to follow us whatever they get us well they get the homie on plaza i get on the 805 south get off on Sweetwater. Well, the police is behind me, San Diego police. So they light me up, pull me over, uh, license registration, I give them all that. You know why I pulled you over? No, I don't. They was like, you don't have a license plate on the front of your car. I said, so you coming south on Highland, I'm going north, you San Diego police out of your jurisdiction and you chase me down because I don't have a license plate on the front of my car. So. He was like, oh, well, it's uh, it's hood day, too. I said, bro, that, I'm not even in that area. That's that's in Southeast. I'm in National City. So he was like, uh, you got any weapons in the car? I'm like, nah. He like, um, well, you already ran my name, so you know I'm not on parole or probation. He's like, you mind if I take a look? I said, look, man, you pulled me over for not having a license plate. Give me my ticket and let me go. Like, all this extra stuff. Don't even need it. He's like, so you're not going to get out the car? I said, no. The man opened the car and grabbed me by my shirt and started pulling me out the car. So by the time he get me out the car, he uh, put me up against the car, arms behind my back, no cuffs yet. And then his partner was like, am I going to find anything in the car? And I said, man, just take me to jail. So they put the cuffs on me and started taking me to the car. And then he found what he found. I go to jail. Now, even once they had me out the car, I never gave them consent to search the car. I said, just take me to jail. I didn't say you was going to find anything. I didn't say, yes, you could search. You always going to do that anyways. So I bail out, go to court. DA didn't pick it up. Okay. Can I jump in here? Okay. So they pull you over. They're obviously racially profiling. They right. basically said that by telling you that it was hood day. Oh, that's, oh, my bad. I'm leaving this part out. He said, it's hood day and you're wearing all this blue. I said, how did you see that from me sitting in the car? Right. Yeah. It's because they was watching the funeral. Right. So they already knew when we got in the car, Who they he's in this car, he's in this car. Go get them. Right. So. So you, so 
Well, you know exactly why they pulled you over, right? Yeah. It wasn't because you didn't have a front license right. on your car. It was because it was hood day, you were dressing all blue, they were watching the funeral, they were trying to see if they could they could hem anybody up that day. They knew exactly what that day was. Right. right. And and they know the likelihood of people having being on parole or probation. They know the likelihood of maybe somebody having something in their car, right? Right. So they're just trying to find something. Right. So the first thing they do is they, they pull you over. They say because first thing you should ask an officer when they pull you over is because they'll toss a question to you. They'll be like, do you know why I pulled you over? Don't do their job for them. Ask them, no, why did you pull me over? I don't know why. Because inadvertently people will tell them, like, oh, I ran a red light. Right. I rolled over that stop sign. I was you texting, just, whatever. You just incriminated yourself. <laughs> yeah. Why are you doing the officer's job for them? No, have them tell you, no, officer, why did you pull me over? That way you could have it on record too, right? You'll have it on record. Yeah, you'd be like, he said he pulled me over for this. He said he pulled me over for this. Yeah. Right? So they say they pull you over because you don't have a front license plate. Cool. Give me the ticket and go, right? The next That's thing what I said. Do, the next thing they do is they ask, they ask you if you mind if they search your car. Did you ever tell them, no, I don't consent to a search? Yeah, I said, no, you can't search my car. He said, why not? I said, because I'm not on parole. I'm not on probation. I don't have any warrants. I'm not doing anything wrong. If you pull me over for not having the front license plate, give me my ticket. Yeah. Then he was like, he said something else. And I was like, man, call your sergeant or something. That's when he got mad and opened the car door and grabbed me by my collar. And so the first thing people should say is because an officer will do that, right? Do you mind if I search your car? And people will consent to a search because they think they have nothing to hide. They don't want to seem guilty, right? But <clears throat> consenting to the search is one of the one of the exceptions to the rule against unlawful searches and seizures. And we always unwillingly give up that, that right, right? By right. consenting to a search. So the first thing people should say is, no, I don't consent to a search. No, I don't consent to a search. You say it loud enough so the body cam hears it. If you got friends in the car, make sure they start recording so that they can hear. Loud you said you didn't consent to a search. If there's anybody else around so they can hear that you said you did not consent to a search. And what will happen, right? It really depends on the officer. Sometimes they'll do exactly what they did to you, right? They'll yank you out the car and they'll search your car anyway, right? That's considered an unlawful search. So this is what happened to you, right? This was an unlawful search. You already said you didn't consent to a search and they searched it anyway. Now anything they find in your vehicle that could be contraband, that could be illegal, is considered fruit of the poisonous tree. It's a legal theory, right? So, this idea that anything that comes from something unlawful is now tainted. Right. You cannot use any of that evidence against you. That's why the DA probably didn't pick it up. Right. Because you didn't consent to search, they searched anyway, so even if they found something, that couldn't be used against you, right? Whereas, let's say you said, oh, you could search my car real quick. Go ahead. Oh, it would have been inside. over with. <laughs> and then they found it, oh, the DA for sure would have picked up those yeah, charges, right? Yeah, yeah. Because now you've given up yeah. You're right. You've given yeah. up your Fourth Amendment right. Now, anything they find is fair game to use against you. Right? right. That's why it was really important that you knew exactly when to say, I do not consent to this search. Right. That's likely why the DA didn't pick it up. So they'll hang you up for a little bit, right? They're going to take you. They're going to arrest you. Say they found these things. Right. Uh, and I feel like even if I didn't bail out, they, they you know how when you go to court, yeah. it would have been a dry run. Yeah, dry run. But I was like, fuck that. I'm not even waiting three days. I got to get, I literally bailed out and went to sleep for three hours and went to work. So but that's what happens, right? And then now you bailed out for a crime that you didn't even commit because they violated your rights. Now you have to pay your money, right? To get yourself out. Right. And that not, that's not even get on the cash bail system, which is designed to keep impoverished people impoverished. We just say your bail was 25,000. Who do you know that's got 25,000 cash? Because for one, if you pay, you can either pay the bail or you can pay a bail as bonds. If you pay the bail, you pay the jail directly. Your bail is twenty-five thousand. You can pay the whole twenty-five thousand. When your court proceedings are over, you get all of your money back, every dime. Now, like we said, we we struggle. I don't know nobody after all get twenty-five thousand from out on a whim. So we go through bail bondsmen, which ten percent, you know, you can negotiate or whatever. Now, say you, you pay the bail bondsman, and now you work up weekly payments and everything, and then your case gets dropped tomorrow. You lose every penny of that. No matter what happens in the case, no matter if you go through the whole court proceedings, no matter if you save a cop's life tomorrow, you still pay. It's, it's designed to keep poor people poor. 
And I kind of want to jump back. So Michael makes a really good point about the money bail system, right? How it's designed to discriminate against certain population, right? It right. disproportionately affects certain populations, right? And he's talking about um, he's talking about the impact on people, right? That why should you have to pay to play in a legal system that's supposed to be just, where I'm supposed to be innocent until proven guilty? Right. Yet the way the cash bail system works is you're going to be incarcerated. That means you're presumed to be guilty right. until you can prove yourself innocent, right? right? right. It works backwards. It does. Right? Yeah, if you got so, money, you can, you, you can get out. You can get away with a few things. And, and research and studies have shown that people are more likely to win their case if they are not incarcerated, right? Mm -hmm. Why is it more difficult to fight your case when you're incarcerated? Can't get your lawyer in answering his phone. Can't yep. speak to anybody. Everybody right. tripping. Can't speak to anybody, right? right? And like you everybody said, once you're already in there, you, you even though you're not sentenced, you're already guilty to them. Yeah. So it's you're at their mercy as opposed to you being on the street. <coughs> They're like, okay, he got a little money. He got a little representation. Coming He's going to be, yeah. Yeah, so what it makes happens, a difference. So what happens is, right, so you get locked up. Now you have this bail. California has one of the highest minimum bails, right? Now you have this bail. If you have the money to pay the entire bail amount, you could get yourself out. And you'll see all that money back at the end of your court case, right? So you're literally paying to say, I will come back to court, right? Whereas most people don't have that entire bail amount. So they'll go through a bail bondsman to negotiate like a percentage that they could get out. What happens is when you pay a bail bondsman, even if you're found not guilty, even if they drop the case against you, that means they don't have any evidence against you, you'll never see that money back. Right. Right? Yeah, I never got my money back. You'll never get that money back. Even if they can't prove a case against you, even if you're found, you go to trial and are found not guilty, even if they drop the charges, no matter what, you'll never get that money back. Right? And so that's the way the, that's the way the prison industrial complex works, right? Is that you have to pay to play. Right. And I kind of want to go back to your, to the situation that you said with you, right? About mm -hmm. how the cops pulled you over. And so we talked about when to say that you don't consent to a search and how important that is, right? Right. Like it was really important in your case. But there are still things that happened in that interaction, right? They yanked you out of the car. Yeah. yeah. I know I, I so, looking back on it, I had a lawsuit. Yeah, yeah, a lawsuit. But I, I did, and, and I want to get to y'all's in a second. Because I, I, I know about, I'm going to get to that in a second, but I took it on the chin, like you said, and people were telling me, like, bro, you got a lawsuit. Like, yeah, they can't do that. Most people yeah, take it on the chin. Why? It's because we're used to being we're treated traumatized. that way. We're traumatized. Right? We think that this is just the way it is. Right. right. And even though this is the way that it is, it's not the way that it's supposed to be. Right? And there are ways for us to fight back on that. Right? So in your case... This is why it's really important to file these complaints. How likely do you think it is that that officer has done that way more than that one time he did that to you? Very likely, right? I, I'm going to tell you something even more crazier. You know how when the DA doesn't pick it up, you got a year to stay out of trouble? A year to, they they got a year a year to, to refile. A year to refile. So that happened April 7, 2017. Let's fast forward to... I want to say May 2018. I'm right here on 47th and Imperial at the gas station. It's at nighttime, right across the street from Lincoln High School. Um, I see the police at the light staring at me. I'm pumping gas. They turn into the parking lot and pull up. On, no, first, I think they call backup. They turn into the parking lot, pull up on me. The other car comes behind us. Four cops, just me. Guess who the two cops are? The same cops. The same two cops who pulled me over the year prior. Hey, I remember you. I'm like, what's up, man? What y'all want now? Now, this time I got my son in the back seat of the car. He's on my phone. They like, uh, license and registration. First thing they say, I'm in the same car. Just like just like him. Black and everything. No license plate on the front again. But I'm pumping gas. I'm like, bro, y'all was at the light. I'm minding my business so i give them my license registration they run it again um they talking about what they found like oh that was real nice that was a nice piece where'd you get it from and all this weird shit trying to be cool uh then the the older cop it was an older white dude and a young hispanic dude the young hispanic dude was the one who yanked me out the car he was the aggressive one the older dude he came back and uh 
the the younger cop asked him like is he good and he was like yeah he's good and then he was like you sure and i'm like this dude so then he's like um you mind if i search your car i said nah bro we already went through this he was like you got lucky last time i said no i didn't get lucky y'all violated my rights there's no luck in that i told you you couldn't search i said and every time you see me i'm gonna tell you no so they was like all right so they just my windows was rolled up like i said my son's in the back seat so they just flashing their lights around they like you see anything the older cops like nah and then my son by this time he look up because his flashlights in the car so he start crying so they was just like all right go ahead get out of here so i get in the car and leave that's the last time i seen those two cops but it was literally a year after they pulled that little stunt and they tried it again and I was like, nah, you can't search my car, homie. And so the, the point I want to make is that these cops that do this, they do this all the time to people, mm -hmm. right? But what we don't do is file complaints against them. So right. the same way that they put us on paperwork for these convictions and these charges, right? They get us on probation and parole. We need to start making a paper trail on them, right. right? And this is the only way that we can do it, right? Is that we file these complaints. Because a lot of the times it's just, well, it's our word against the cop. Like, we know the officers that do this in, in our neighborhoods, right? right? We can probably point them out, we can name them, we probably know their badge numbers. It's that same cop every single time that do X, Y, and Z to our people, right? But there's no paperwork against it. It's just our word against theirs. So it never happened. So it's like it never happened. So who are they going to believe? Right? You or a police officer? You know what I'm saying? And right? so when people ask, like, why would I file a complaint? It's not going to do anything. It may not do anything for your particular case, but what it will do is it'll create a paper trail on these police officers, right? right? right. So we create these paper trails on these police officers, so then later on down the line, let's say they end up hurting somebody, right? And that person decides to sue them, right? right. Now we can look up their, this, police's, this police officer's record and say, dang, they got 10 complaints against them for doing the same exact thing to right. other people, right? Yeah. Now it ruins their credibility. Now it ruins their credibility. Right now, there's more um, validity to what you're saying about this particular police officer. Right, it helps to prove the case. Right, right. And not only do these complaints help for for that, they also help because what, if an officer has a lot of complaints against him, it prevents him from getting promoted. It prevents him from getting raises. Right. It prevents them from moving up in their positions, and especially if they are not doing their jobs right. If they're not doing their jobs correctly, they should not continue to move up in their career. Right, and so these these complaints put marks on them, right? And that's what we want to do: continue to mark up their records, right? Continue to document every the way that they document our communities. Continue to document them and what they are doing to our communities, right? Um, so we flipping the switch on them. And then another thing, like with our community members, like people that live in our community, they, a lot of them think that. Cause I, I see it all the time or hear about it all the time. Oh, whoop de whoop, got hemmed up. I hit him up. Hey, what's up, bro? You want to file a complaint? Oh, nah. And they got the lamest reasons. One is, oh, um, that's like snitching on the police. And I'm like, yeah. bro, are you serious? Right. I said, I give them a scenario. I said, okay, let's say you're walking through Walmart and you slip on a big wet puddle in aisle eight and they don't have a wet floor sign. Are you going to sue them? They're like, hell yeah. What's the difference, bro? Right. What's the difference? If you get hit by rear ended in, in the, at a stoplight and the dude that hop out is a billionaire are right. you gonna sue that man right get some, try to get some money what is this i feel like that's the only way we can properly fight back i mean yeah. you, it's either that or like you said you go out in the blaze of glory and most people is not willing to do that yeah, we're not ready so for that. so so what else can you do you can't just keep letting them get away with it you got they have to yeah. suffer some type of repercussions for their actions yeah. for every action there's a reaction yeah. and they'll start to think twice about violating our rights if we start applying the pressure that's, that's exactly what i was about to say where the other excuse is oh well you know i'm living that life i don't want the, the police to be on me more like as a form of retribution for following the complaint and i say like okay well if you don't file a complaint, are they going to stop fucking with you? Exactly. You're you know not. what I'm saying? And, and, and in my experience, because like I walk it like I talk it. I don't just, you know, I got an active lawsuit against the SDPD right now. I'm about to get, I can't talk about it because it's active. I want to get into but, that. But, um, what's I about to say? <laughs> but if you, you about to get, uh, damn, I have a good ass point too. It'll come back. Yeah, it'll come back. <laughs> it'll come back. Let's, let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about, um. What happened, I know it was in during the, 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 the 2020 year. I don't even want to say that word because YouTube be tripping. Yeah. The P word. Yeah. Um, it was during 2020.
2020 was a lot of stuff going on out here. I think after uh, uh, what is it? Floyd. Floyd. Yeah. Um, George Floyd. Yeah. George. Floyd. Um, it was a lot of stuff going on that day, and you and a few other homies got pulled over. What happened? Well, um, like you said, the George Floyd incident was going on um, the day before. We went out, uh, got pulled over. It was um, the city of La Mesa got burned down. If anybody's familiar with San Diego, we have sub cities and La Mesa is one of our sub cities and the Black Lives Matter people rioted and protested through there and pretty much burnt most of downtown La Mesa down. The next uh, the next day, it's, some white, it's a post on social media. It's a white guy driving a big old lifted truck with a Confederate flag sticking out the tailgate. It's another white guy. He got like a crocodile Dundee whip whipping it on the corner. They're calling passerbys, niggers and shit, telling, and the, and the point of their post is, they wish niggas would come out to Santee, like, so I made a post, like, you know, I know we ain't about to let no six teeth, 110 pound white boys tell it, and so we met, a, me and a few other community members, we met up at Malcolm X Library, um, all gang members, you know, and uh, we pushed to Santee. Long story short, it was beautiful. You know, I said a silent prayer because I got like three, four strikes all for violent crime. I didn't know how the situation was going to turn out. Right. I could have got struck out, but I was willing to, you know, put my, my life on the line for the cause. Went out there, everything was beautiful. We leave Santee, we go to Encanto because it's 12, it's 12 community members with us. Nine Damus, Bloods, three Crips. So we go to Encanto, which is a, right down the street from here. We high five, we feeling real good about ourselves. Little do we know it's a police spotter watching us the whole time. So we, you know, we chill there. There was another protest going on downtown because we in the rallying mode right now. You right. know what I'm saying? We in the protesting mode. So we like, fuck it, we just gonna go downtown to the other one downtown. So I guess the police spotter that's watching the whole thing see the only three Crips get in one vehicle and everybody else get. So I'm gonna just do a little math for you. Anybody that knows Southeast can just you know. We, we, we at this liquor store, right? We, we go up in Canto towards La Mesa, bust the U-turn, come all the way down Imperial. You know, it's a little ways to get to the right. 805. Right. Visit. All the way down Imperial, get on the 805 North, junction to the 94, 94 West, West. we're going downtown. Right. And when we look back, it's police doing over 100, way back in the distance just to get to, to our catch car. up. Pull us over on the freeway. And this is my first time ever being pulled over with my rights have been restored. I'm off parole. I got my discharge card in my pocket. I can't wait to tell the police. Hell nah, you can't search me. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm in the car with two of my homies. But you but but you gotta know that for them to be coming that fast and that deep, they didn't care what you was talking about. Exactly. We was coming out the car. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Everybody I was in the car with wasn't on anything, you know what I'm saying? One of my homies records was clean and he could be an astronaut if you want. Never had a book right. on his record at all. You right. Know what I'm saying? They pulled us out on the freeway. Um because they pulled the driver out first. They pulled my homie Crip and Chris out. The and second. and the driver is the, the squeaky clean homie that could be an astronaut, yes. a, a a surgeon, a lawyer. Like he said they they seen us at the I guess they thought we had guns in the car. You know they, we were coming out the car. They didn't even ask they no infractions, anything, no life as soon as they pulled y'all over, and get out the car. My, and I'm on my Facebook Live at the time. So as I get my ID out my wallet, my wallet falls. When my wallet falls, I got four cops, two on this side, two on this side. I said, hey, bro, my wallet just filled. Can I pick my wallet up? You know, just trying to, I don't want to make no sudden moves. The cop told me, why would you, why would you do that with all these gun blazing something? I'm not sure what he said verbatim, but it was something that really, like, Basically, we ready to shoot your yeah, ass. Yeah, you make a yeah. move for that gun. I said, like, seriously, bro, like, I would have to be Billy the Kid to reach down and get the drop on four cops. Like, I said, let me ask you something. If your wallet fell, would you just let it sit there? Like, you depriving me my as, as a man. Fuck right. a citizen, you know what I'm saying? Long story short, they got it. Took me out the car, too. Put my cuffs on super tight. Separated my phone from me put me in the car for I got traumatic prison experience. What did they even cuff y'all for? What was y'all being detained for? They never gave us any it, he was in a brand new truck. Right. Like, no everything worked. They did a hundred to get to us, but the spotter was on us, but for the unmarked cars, they did a hundred to it took them that long to catch up to us. They, you know what I'm saying? No reason at all. And they just asked y'all to get out the car and everything. They, they got us out one at a time. They got the driver out. They pulled y'all out? Yeah. Everybody said, no, you can't search, no, 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 and they did it anyway. 
So when I finally get, you know, they didn't find nothing, of course. They let us go. And I called my, um, my, my sister in the fight, Layla, and she was like, man, go holler at this lawyer right now. He waiting for you at Malcolm X Library. And we went through the proper channels because any, what we need everybody to know is if you say like your incident, you had a lawsuit, bro. Right. But for you to get that lawsuit, you, know, you have to take steps. And right. the first step is to file a complaint. You just can't come and sue them off jump. Right, right, right. You got to file a complaint. And then go through the, you got to go through the legal steps. So, and a lot of these times people really got like lawsuit type cases, yeah. but we just take. And then there's a process too. That was in 2020. We in 2023 and this still hasn't even been settled. I forgot, I forgot all about it, bro. To but, be honest. But there's, I, there's one thing I wanted to say, homie. Um, that going to Santee, that was gangster to me. That was real because we so quick to get on each other. We so quick to get on somebody who look like us because he from over there or what he wearing. And then they get on the internet and say they wish they would come out there and for y'all to rally up as a people. And that's black and brown because I, I know it wasn't just black people. No, it was, it was a few essays too. For y'all to rally up and to go out there and show we here. Yeah, push it all on the line. That's one honey right there. Yeah, I, it, it felt good, you know, because any prison nigga... And anybody, like, my bad, anybody who knows about Santee... Um, AKA Clanty, that's a um, predominantly uh, Caucasian area, and it's a lot of, um, especially back in the days, a lot of racial tension and racism over in that area. I don't really know how much it is. It's changing now. Not to mention they have uh, white white supremacist gangs out there. But right. if you ask the San Diego District Attorney, there is no such thing as no white gang. The GSU, the gang supremacy. No, no, Lakeside. They 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 be on G GSU, Lakeside Gangsters. But they never got. They never get gang enhancement. That's what I'm talking about, gang enhancements. Oh. I did research to where everybody that ever got a gang enhancement in the last 10 years, and the only two people that I found that were white were from either a Crip or a, a Crip blood or an SA hood. To add to, to what Michael was saying is that we did a public records request to see how many people and what race are the people that get gang enhancement. And out of all the people that were incarcerated in San Diego, only two people were non uh were white. were white that were given a game and like you said they were from either a, yeah. a black gang or a hispanic That's gang right. like snow right they don't give a fuck you know what i mean and even back in the days with the original slave catchers if they found found a white person i say it was a white person that was the slave and he was cool with them Helping blacks. They would hang his ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all them white folks that you see in prison. They, they just like that. They don't care about them. That's the poor white trash. They should be right. They should the same category as us. Right. It's a class thing. Yeah, it's a definitely a class thing. If you down here, you down here, no matter what race you Capitalism, are. Capitalism, man. Welcome to America. And the, and the way that enhancement works is that it's the enhancements that lock people up for a very long time. Definitely. Right? So you can add a gang enhancement to let, let's say an assault charge an assault charge you're looking at maybe two years a gang enhancement could add 10 yeah. years to your yep. sentence seen it, seen it malcolm my, my co-worker he got a 13 year sentence three year base term 10 year enhancement people doing way past they base term on enhancement. listen i didn't got caught with guns you know that carry 16 2 and 3. 16 months two years three years the the low the mid the max um if it's your first time, you're probably looking at six months, 180 days, something crazy like that, no prison time. But they'll say, all right, we'll give you 16 months. But you're a gang member, so we're gonna double you up to 32 months. And you got a prison prior, so we're gonna add another year on top of that. And you got a strike already, so now we're gonna double you up. So instead of you looking at two or three years, you are now at six years with 80 to 85%. That's how they got people sitting on these yards forever. And that's why it's so overcrowded. Yeah. And that's why they have to change. Well, they are changing these laws and people are coming home yeah. because you got people just taking up space on them yards. And the California prison system once wanted to build more prisons. And the federal was like, no, y'all got to start letting people go and closing some of these prisons down. In order to do that, they had to change laws to decrease the population. California has 33 state prisons not counting the fire camps, mm -hmm. not counting the private jails, not counting the people that they have in Mississippi, Oklahoma, and Arizona. I think they shut them down. They shut them down. Yeah, there's yeah, no but more out of state. Years, they was, but it was all came from the three strikes law from 94 up. The, 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 the P 
penile system just got congested. Because like you said, they'll take an offense that will usually give you 16 months. Now you're doing nine with 85. You know right. What I'm saying? And that's where it got congested. But what saved a lot of uh, the laws and them changing stuff was all the prison deaths from lack of medical care. Medical care. It was right. like a person a day dying in prison. And that's, they started coming with like Prop 47, Prop 57. I was in prison when that goes happened. That was, motherfuckers was leaving by the bus load, bro. Like, count time clear at that five o'clock count, whatever. And you just see like 30 people. What, going home? Going home. When that shit first That's happened. a beautiful thing. Yeah. But me, I was like, huh, oh, because I didn't apply for none of that shit. Right. But my homie did, though. My folks did, though. So it's, it was a beautiful Yeah, thing. when you get to see people that, because like you said, you didn't apply for it, but you also didn't have life. You had a date. Yeah. So when you start seeing people come home, uh, just like the homie I was supposed to interview before I came here, I was in Sentinella with him 2010, 2011, and he was telling me, I'm coming home. Now, he didn't come home to what, 2020, 2021, but he had already been down like 20 years and did an extra 10. He was like, when I come home, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And now, y'all here living his life. Yeah, yeah. they changed it a lot back when, you know, they wasn't letting no, you would go to board time and time again. And then they started finally letting life was out. But pillars of the community, what we do, we, we work with legislation as well. We had a real big part of them changing that felony murder law to where people that get convicted just because they're with somebody and they kill somebody and they get life without too, they was giving them action at getting home. We, we had a huge part in the free phone calls thing. That shit is right. I just got three phone calls from somebody in jail. I don't know who it is. I ain't gonna lie, the homies in jail be harassing us, oh man. Oh my God. <laughs> Hey, they the won't earth, stop. <laughs> they won't stop. They're like, man, it's free. Yeah. You know we got shit to do. I can't be on the phone with all of y'all all hey, day. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but it's a beautiful thing. Get to talk to your people. You right. Know, one less worry you gotta worry about. Right, definitely. Um, I know this is unrelated. I made a video about this the other day, the fifty fifty yards. I don't know if you've seen it. You know they have a petition right now to end that. They should. Um I think they they need like twenty five hundred signatures they got like 2100 i don't know when the deadline is but it's a lot of people who's uh the family of people who are on SNY yards who feel like their family is in danger mm -hmm. and they said it's uh they considered it a uh, premeditated murder yeah. so they're saying you're going to put this person who should be in protective custody over here with this person um mm -hmm. that's just all bad so those might be coming to an end real soon and the flip side they even flip it to where if you're a good dude and you're on the yard with those people they consider you bad now you right so it's both it's both levels yeah it's creating more confusion and chaos yeah definitely they um like i said i came home in february 2018 that january they put up the memo saying that they're about to start integrating those the yards in 50 50 so i've never personally seen it myself right me either because i said it, 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 it added a lot of controversy and this is my take on it just me personally once you go to your reception yard in prison and you see your counselor, you can recommend two prisons. They don't give a fuck. The CSR board is going to send you where they want to send you. Right. Now, let's say you got eight years with eight years, 66 or whatever it is. You're already missing your family. You're missing your kids. Your mama's sick. The homies ain't hollering at you. And they send you to one of these 50-50 yards. What do the homies expect you to do? Because if you just go put down your, your bare robe, go to the day room and take off, all they're going to do, they might even not even take you to the hole. They're going to take you to the hole, make you sign marriage chrono, bring you right back. <laughs> right. You have to physically... But, but I, think, I, think, I think at first, getting off was working. It was... When they first started it, taking off, it was getting them out of there. Once they seen a pattern, they start bringing you back, you like you said. Back. You have to and, physically, like, get your points raised and, you know, catch shoes and go to different yards. It's like, they can send you to the most elite, high desert, 180 design prison in California. With everybody on that motherfucker got a hundred years or better. And they let the whole yard out, every building, 1,200 people. You as an individual, you probably gonna fuck with 15 people, tops, 20. Just like on them yards. Now, if you on the SNY yard and you eating with chomos and, you know, right. then that's different. But if you on there doing your paperwork good, I don't see it as no big, that big of a deal, bro. You know what I'm saying? That's just my, my take on it because what you gonna do? Go catch four, five more years, or catch a shoot term, then get your points ripped. Then they gonna mess around and do it in the level threes and the four. They saying they supposed to be creeping all the way up. Nah, they not though. They said that, but it ain't working. Yeah, it ain't working. But um, my 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 main thing, the, the, for the subscribers who haven't been incarcerated or if you have, uh, just stay out of prison. 
it don't sound like a fun place. Um, Especially in this it's day not day. a fun place. I know it's not. But, yeah, in this day and age, it's getting worse and worse. Yeah. This is probably not something you want to do, not a life you want to live. If you already lived it, you should probably find something better to do. At some point, you got to grow up. And then it goes back to what you were saying earlier. It's like easy to get in, but it's hard to get out. Once you're on that paper, it's like a revolving door. You know what I mean? Right. Motherfuckers ain't been on paper since they was 12, 13 years old, be 40, 45 years old, you know? Right. Messing with that penal system and the way the laws are designed. Now, we, uh, we had a video shoot recently. Um, I think you left before I came. Yeah. I didn't even know you was in it until the video came out. <laughs> I'm like, where was there, he at? I wasn't there when, when Boosie came, but I was in it. Yeah, right, right, yeah. right. Uh, knowing you, I'm like, he probably got to go to work or something. Yeah, I did. But um, did. so when you heard about Boosie getting locked up, what what was your thoughts on that? Oh, I, already, I, I immediately knew that he was another victim of his rights being violated, racial profiling, because um, from what my understanding, the homies was on the street deep on 49, and the police wrote, for one, it was already hot in the hood the whole day prior to that. They've been like that every day. But then I heard, like, right before the incident, people started leaving, like, one rolled through, so they already peeped, but they already right. knew what they wanted to do because they got spotters. And that's one of the, you, a lot of people think just cops are in black and white patrol cars, and that is the first. A cop will pull up on you on a Harley. You here's, here's my thing. You're right about that. I think not only was it being promoted, tap in on Saturday for the video shoot, they're automatically going to be like, let us see if it's in the hood first. If not, then we're going to try to do our due diligence and see if it's somewhere else. Then they're going to try to crash that. First place they're going to look is in the hood. So driving through the hood, you see it. They came out the alley. First, we was in the alley shooting scenes. Then, I don't know, you know, we was in the, in the yard. They could have been driving down the street, but we was in the yard. So by the time we come out and we on the corner, I see one come out the alley. They go up 09. They know we around there because all the cars is in the middle of the street. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they know we around there. So uh, they come out the alley. Then they driving up towards Hilltop and they kind of slowing down. I'm like, oh, they look like they're about to come back. So everybody was like, we was already pretty much done by that time. So I don't know if you've seen that little clip of Boosie on the Breakfast Club. And he was saying that uh, his sugar, you know, he's diabetic. His sugar has started dropping. Yeah. So I think he wanted to leave because of that. So we shot the last scene and he was the first one to leave. Now, unbeknownst to us, there's 10 cop cars around the corner probably waiting to hit us. Yeah. He ran into them. Or waiting to pick niggas off as they Yeah. Did. He went that way, they pulled him over first. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. For people who was thinking, I'd seen all kind of it, stuff. It we was wild. The we, was yeah, wild we, we, we set him up. We. We threw the gun in his car. All kind of crazy stuff they were saying in the comments. Yeah. But, um, and I still don't know nothing about no gun. You know, the police scandals, they could have put that there. Yeah. Um, yeah, he ran into him, and that was unfortunate. Yeah, but um, whatever they pulled him over for, or gave him the reason for pulling him over for, they shouldn't have searched his vehicle regardless, you know what I'm saying? So, I'm pretty sure he needed to search his seat. I, I, yeah. So, and I'm trying to get at, you know, I hollered at my boy. We see it too many times that the police, you know, they'll, you know, can I search your car? You say no, and they search it anyway. So right. I'm trying to holler at his boy, um, his manager, B Max, so I can, you know, I want to file a complaint because a lot of people don't know that if they do search your car and they find something, the only real action at beating it is the, for one, don't give consent. And for two, like filing a complaint and going through the process of trying to get it thrown right. out. Because once they see that you're fighting back like that, they don't want the headache. They want the easy kill. Mm -hmm. They don't want to chase you down. They yeah. want it to. They want you to just give up and yeah. just. All right, what this, you want? This cop, this, this That's exactly did. why police do these do this in our neighborhoods, right? Why do they? Why do they ham everybody up in their in our neighborhoods? It's because they know that they can. Right. Right. It's because we've allowed them to do that. Right. They don't say if, if they did that in La Jolla, what do you think the white people in La Jolla would do? They would complain. They don't do that in, in neighborhoods where people actually would file a complaint against them. Right. And that's why it's so important for us in our communities, when they're doing that to our communities, when they're harassing us, when they're racially profiling us, when they're discriminating against us, that we continue to hold them accountable for the things that they are doing wrong in our communities. Yeah. So when y'all see this, because they be watching my channel, 
We on your ass. Straight up. We hold the police accountable. We're not taking it on the chin no more. Like just because like you make it seem like people who chose to grow. We grew up in here by you know by four, not choice. We, we live where we live. Right. And just because we live in a crime ridden area, you know, give us more resources over here. You know what I mean? It's no resources. The streets is cracked, no jobs, no nothing for the youth. My neighborhood is like one of the most notorious, un notoriously underserviced neighborhoods in San Diego. There's nothing over there. There's nothing over there. And I'm 46. My mama grew up over there. There's never been a youth sports center, a peewee, ba baseball team, a, a basketball association. Everybody. The school don't got no sports. There's no rec center like you said. There's nothing in the hood. There's nothing to do. It's, it's been like that for the last 50, 60 years. I want to add to what you're saying, Greg, right? because it's really, really important. I want to hold it here. Because one of the things that you said was that you live in a crime ridden neighborhood, right? And that's exactly what the police see, right? They think that our neighborhoods are, we are just out committing crimes. But what have we found? What has data found about crime ridden neighborhoods? Crime ridden neighborhoods are neighborhoods that are under resourced, right? People that are impoverished, people that, that don't have access to the resources that they need to sustain a living, right? So, people, so crime, these kinds of crimes are directly related to lack of access to resources, directly right. related to poverty, right? Directly related because people are trying to make ends meet, right? And the only way to combat that is to fund resources in these communities, right? Data and research has shown that if you invest into your community, you provide places for people to go, you provide employment opportunities for people, you provide after school programs for folks, you provide rec centers for people, right? That they are more likely not to commit these kinds of crimes, right? What? Because they have somewhere to go, they have something to do. They are resourced in a way that can make a meaningful impact to their communities. Yeah, crime ridden doesn't have anything to do with being black. You go to Paris, I'm pretty sure it's a ghetto in Paris, you know what I'm saying? Wherever there's poverty, there's gonna be crime. Saying. So it's not a black or brown thing. It's just a, it's an eco, 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 economical st status thing. Yeah, it's all we, about money. And, and then, like you said, historically, they'll underfund black and brown communities. Right. right? They'll be, like you said, under, under, under resourced and over policed. That's right. I mean, you pull over a hundred cars, of course you're gonna get three people. Right. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And then they'll justify it by, see, but we found, like, but the majority of people, you wouldn't have found nothing on. Another thing I wanted to uh, touch on um, in, in Southeast San Diego is real big right now is these smart street cameras. I don't know if you guys are up, uh, up on it, but if you look up on any street, every other street camera, you can see it's a street camera. Now, if we walk out right now, I probably could show you one right on one of these. But um, in San Diego, we put an ordinance in to where they're still operational, which SDPD can't re allegedly review the footage, but they're trying to end it, and not only end it, put four million more into these street cameras. So our community members need to be aware of these, street, these smart street cameras, and not just the smart street cameras, they have stuff called the, the shot spotters. Now say we right here and somebody just starts shooting, or a car backfires, or any kind of loud bang, the shot spotter is gonna gauge the loudness and allegedly can tell if it's a shot, it's a bat, if a backfire, and their 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 results, their they are horrible. They pull up on people, and it was like people playing loud. A music. firecracker so or something. What do, you, what do you think cops are gonna do if they got reports of shots being fired? Then they pull up over here. They aggressive. gonna pull up aggressive, aggressive. yeah. Guns drawn, you know what I mean? Yeah. And the, and the technology is so unreliable. Yeah. Can I just add to that a little bit, right? So there were already currently hundreds of these street, uh, smart street lights um, that are up and running throughout San Diego, right? Now the police want to install 400 more smart street light cameras. What's important to know about this is that um, they already have them up and they already have some up, right? Now they want to add 400 more. And if you look at where they want to place them, they are majority in Southeast San Diego, right? You see very few all the way up north in La Jolla or, or, Del, or Del Mar areas. Right. Most of them are concentrated in our communities, right? And what's really um, scary about this is that the police have not given much information on where all of our data is going. So these smart streetlights are continuously recording it and tracking it. 
and the technology is is pretty wild right so they can program it to say um, follow anybody wearing blue follow anybody wearing an, an SD, SD hat yeah. right so now they can use this technology and that's what SCPD has been using right to monitor our communities co to continuously track our communities right they that's already crazy. do that as much as they already do that right you've given so many stories about right. talking about you're leaving a certain place and there's already 10 cop cars lined up they were watching all y'all right. right but now with this technology they can continuously and constantly record and track your every movement and they have audio too some of them have audio accessibility and like michael was saying right a lot of the times police officers will say that they're using this technology to solve these kinds of crimes and x y and z um but what we found is that a that the data is not reliable, right? Like for a shot spotter, for example, right? That it hasn't been reliable. And yet still, they put people in, a, in very precarious situations, right? Because like you said, if they pull up to a place where they think it's gunshots, they're gonna come with guns drawn, Aggressive. right? Yeah. Aggressive, ready um, to, to hem up people in the community, right? And so that's why it's really important to know what SCPD is doing, how much money they're trying to invest in this kind of technology, because what we know is that they'll continue to use this technology against our communities, yes. right? That it'll disproportionately impact our communities uh, and impact our safety, right? Mm hmm It's a cold game. Yeah. They're watching and listening a lot, so. But, but if anybody was watching this, the three things that we want you to, you know, get out of this whole training was, um, for one, never give consent to, to be searched, ever. I don't care if you don't got nothing. Don't ever give up your, your, your right for search. Two, um, one, never give consent. Two, shut the fuck up. Don't ever answer questions. If you're being detained, don't ever answer questions. And the three is the, am I, am I free or am I being detained? That is... In San Diego, that's a pillars thing. Once you say that, they know that you kind of, if you're not associated with pillars, then you at least kind of know what you're talking about. If, if you're free to go, walk away. If you're detained, don't say anything at all because nobody has ever beaten a charge saying, oh, I wasn't at this liquor store, I was at this liquor store. And the detective was like, you know what? You are right. Get the handcuffs off this man. You know what? We sorry. Where can we drop this? Right. It never happened in the history right. of, of investigations. Right. So just don't say nothing. You know what I mean? That's your best bet. For sure. Get out of this. Man, I appreciate y'all. Um, if y'all want to let the people know where to find y'all, if they got any questions. Yeah, uh, Michael at Pillars of the Community, P O T C S D dot org. That's Michael, M I C H A E L, at P O T C S D dot org. And hers is Michele. Yeah, Michele at um, P O T C S D dot org. And Michele is spelled M I T. C-H-E-L-L-E And if anybody ever get harassed by the law enforcement and they're not uncertain on what to do, hit one of them emails, hit up Hoodie Hood, have him get it. And at Pillars, we'll walk you through the whole process. Even if you, we'll, we'll type it up for you and everything, give you all the legal mumbo jumbo you need to do to put it in and everything and help you fight, fight back. Right, man. Well, that'll do it for this episode. Hoodlum gang, I appreciate y'all. Let me know what y'all think in the comments. Let me know if y'all got any questions. Um, and like he said, if y'all need to be in contact with them, uh, hit me on Instagram and I can point you in the right direction. Or email us. Or email. That being said, y'all have a good one.